Uh, Only God knows I love you I don't even know you Only God But knows. I know you And I love you First What's happening? I'm First Level And this is the first episode of my new show Everybody Got a Story uh, I started this show because I wanted to shed light on some of the extraordinary stories of extraordinary people who uh, ordinarily don't have a, an opportunity to tell their stories. Uh, we have people like that among us every day in our communities, uh, but because they don't have the money or the fame uh, nobody takes the time to just sit down and truly ask them questions. And so that's what I want to do. I don't want to uh, try to get the big names uh, and all that kind of stuff. There's plenty of uh, shows that do that, plenty of podcasts that do that. Uh, what I intend for this to be uh, now and into the future is a platform, again, for extraordinary people. I don't want to call them ordinary people or regular people because they're not famous. Because these people that you will see on this platform are indeed extraordinary. And they have extraordinary stories. It's just that ordinarily, they don't get a chance to share. And so, uh, I, could, I could think of no one better to start it off with than my mother, Mary Wells. Uh, without her, I have no story, uh, but in her own right, her story is incredible. It's a story of uh, great tragedy, uh, perseverance, uh, education, whether it be educating herself or educating children. Uh, being a mother, being a daughter, being my everything. So without further ado, I bring to you the first episode of Everybody Got a Story. This is the Mary Wells interview. So mom, you were born in Jasper County, Mississippi, right? Jasper County, Newton, Mississippi. Okay, so Newton, which is in Jasper County. Yes. Yeah. All right, so what do you remember about that area? I know we've been back down there for uh, family reunions and stuff like that. So how do you describe that area of Mississippi? Bleak. This, this, uh, it's an area that I didn't find comfortable because I didn't know anybody down there. The people that I was being introduced to, I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. Didn't grow up down there. Had no idea that I came from down there other than when I just going down there for family reunions and basically that was for my uncle, my mama, and my aunt. Mm. We children didn't know we were just there. Okay. Well, now, and it was a bad place because that's when my father got killed and I never knew it. Okay, we're going to get into that. Uh, now, let, let's talk about how Granny, this is weird, you told me that Granny and her cousin end up marrying two brothers, right? Yeah, they were first cousins. And so that was what, son and mama? The, my aunt, Lil Ann, as we call her, Lil Ann, mm -hmm. because it was the three or four Anns in the family. So Lil Ann and my mom was Nancy. Both of them were Hilton. Mm -hmm. And they, they married to Gibson. My daddy, Leroy Gibson, and Lil Ann married uh, Jesse Frank Gibson, mm -hmm. my uncle. So Lil Ann's children and I are double kin. And Mom, I remember Grandmama telling me that uh, the way that uh, your pops won her over was by uh, riding his horse over there to see her. Uh, have you heard any other uh, good stories or fun stories about your pop? They told me that he was very crazy about my mama. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
he used to, when he called her Nancy, and uh, when she got baptized, he told the preacher he better not hurt her or let her drown or anything, because he's going to come in there after him. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> he was... I never heard of that. <laughs> that one. Uh, then he was very protected of his of his mama. He jumped on his daddy and beat him up for for jumping on his mama one time. They almost killed him. And it, my grandma was calling him war, war. Don't hurt him, war. Don't kill him, war. And so, he, everybody was just afraid of him. He was he didn't take no bull off of anybody. And uh. That was it. I mean, uh, just it. He was just crazy about my mama, so they say. And, and he liked to ride horses. He was he could do tricks on horses. Then uh, and what was his plan the, with the horse? He could go, go jump down and jump back up on him and turn around and ride him. And he had said he was going to make. Uh, take his family to Hollywood because he was going to make some money and become a big star. You see where I get it from, see that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. Uh, and yeah. he loved to dance. I like to dance. Can't daddy dance happy? I love to dance too, so. It's going to be nice because we're... <laughs> All right, now you alluded to the fact that uh, that he was indeed uh, murdered. And I, I talked about that uh, in the song briefly. In a song, I can't tell a whole story. It just, you know, I only got a few minutes and stuff to, to talk about. I did used to share the story with my students because my students used to love to gamble, like my student Charles Dickens, what up? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I used to tell them I didn't gamble because of what happened to my grandfather and stuff like that. So uh, if you can, can you kind of touch on what Granny told you about that uh, situation? Cause I think that's so unique in your story. And uh, I, I, I said before to my fans that if there's a movie about my life, I want the movie to start with that. Because I feel like that's, that's the event that really uh, start to shape our family, you know? We lack strong men in our family, and uh, you know, until me, really. And then I feel like the, you know the murder of my grandfather kind of start set that up. Well, uh, my mother told me about it uh, later on in life. Right? She didn't tell me as a little girl because I grew up thinking that somebody else that she had married was my father. I didn't know anything about my father until I was in the 11th grade. Uh, and she told me that uh, she was with him. They were at a house party, I guess, uh, and they were gambling. The, um, the, my, my granddaddy's cousin, husband, got into it with another man and my daddy was trying to intervene but he had turned around and started walking off and the man took the knife and stabbed at him just as he turned around and he hit him right in the heart uh, with the knife and my mama had me in her arm and uh, I guess everybody started calling the ambulance or did whatever they could or what have you, but she had to get me home. And that's all I heard about it. I heard about it from her because she was there. And she shared the story with his siblings. So, so when did you learn the truth then? I, 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 well, how did you learn the truth in 11th grade? Okay, um, my grandmother was a Chapman, Lily Bell Chapman, and her brother, oldest son, had heard that 
I was in Mississippi, Canton, Mississippi, and uh, now th this is a story that they told me uh, later in life. I was in my 60s or something, because I never knew that they came there. I don't remember. They say that they came up on, the, it was called Owing Street. Street then it wasn't Martin Luther King, but they came over to my grandmother. They came over to my mama's house, and they said they found me, and uh, they saw me. Uh, but I never met my grandparents or my uncles and cousins and all of them until I was in the eleventh grade. I went over there. Mm -hmm. on a bus and they picked me up in Birmingham, Alabama and took me over there to meet my real family for the first time in my life. And maybe I would have had a better life and I wouldn't have had to go through some of the things I had to go through as a child growing up. I would have had a real family. I never had a real family other than my mother. And that was it. So when you finally met them, how did they uh, respond to you? How, did, how was that meeting them for the first time? It was weird. It was different. It just didn't... I was glad to see them. I could see the similarities. And one of my aunts that I finally met from Chicago, I saw we could look like, we look like twins. That ain't peaches, right? Uh, peaches. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just different. I just uh, met them and they were a fun family. And my uncles liked to drink, gamble, uh, laugh, have fun, chase women. Yeah, they were just typical family, I guess, because I'd never been around them. I... So what made Grandmama move up here then, from down there, in, 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 uh, from uh, Jasper County? What made her come up this way to camp? My mama, her, her oldest brother, and uh, her sister, Ina Mae, were deserted left with their daddy by their mama and she left him because he had attempted to kill her and uh, then he had killed the man and he went to prison. Uh, they left, they lived with uh, various family members there and a, and a lady in Chicago that I finally met raised them for a little while and a half and a white woman which was their great-grandmother uh, and I recently learned that my grandmother was, mother was a Creole from New Orleans. Now I guess she got there and she married Mr. Hilton, Abe Hilton, but after she eventually escaped him, left him, and she moved to Carthage, Mississippi. And I understand that my mommy and found out where she was and they, mama was pregnant with me. Uh, and my, her brother's wife was pregnant with uh, uh, his Snuffy. son. We call him Snuffy, but his name was Winnie Abe. So it's about uh, six months, six months, six months between each one of us. But she, my grandmother was in the house with a baby, and she was a businesswoman because she ran a cafe. She owned the only black cafe, maybe the only cafe there. She was a... Uh, she was going with this white man, and she and this white man was running the cafe. She was pregnant, with, about to have a baby, so they started visiting her. And uh, 
One of them stayed there, Ayanna me, I think, you know, while Mama went back home, and Ayanna may stayed there until she had the baby. And when she had the baby, the white women ran her out of, well, she got, they said she couldn't keep that baby because he was white. So she gave him away, and the white women ran her out of Carthage. And my, when my mother and found out where she was in Canton, my mama and Uncle Bud followed her to Canton, and Ayanna May had married a man, uh, Indian, half Indian, in from uh, uh, Carthage, so she stayed in Carthage. And my mama and Uncle Bud ended up here. So you telling me stuff that you ain't never told me. Whitney, you never asked me. As I hell. So how would you describe Grandma? I describe her as the sweetest person of all time. How would you describe her? My mama was the sweetest person of all time. She was always smiling. Uh, I never heard my mother gossip. I never heard her say a negative word about anybody. So she was my role model. She was the strongest woman I know, but she was just abused, but she had to do what she had to do in order to make a living for me. And I, I think if, if I had to say one of her weakest points was, and, uh, and it wasn't a weak point because at that particular time, if you weren't married, you were considered as a whore. Well, a woman, if she wasn't married, everybody knew that she was going to be doing something. So if, maybe that's why she, was a, she had to marry whoever she married in order to have a living. But she always worked. She, my grandmother, after she came to Canton, she became a seamstress. She, so she's still a business woman. So my mama learned how to sew. She started sewing, so she had a trade. She, she was kind, sweet, not the best educated woman, but she always wanted to get an education. That's why when they had some a program from Washington, they had uh, where adult people that didn't get a lot of education could go to school at night. And she started doing that in order to uh, learn. She always wanted to learn. And she couldn't help me with my lesson because she didn't know it herself but she did the best she could with me. And like I said, she was my perfect role model if she wasn't to anybody else. I, I molded my life after four women. One was my mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, Sister Vera Marie, and Sister Thea Bowman. Those four women. And I think God sees that in me. I see it in me. Now, if I'm not mistaken, now, the reason why Grandma didn't get a lot of education is because she had to drop out to help be a sharecropper, right? I know she, well, that's what she told us, that she had to pick cotton. She had to basically go and... Well, that's what I said. The situation back then didn't mm -hmm. allow... A lot black of black kids, kids had to do didn't, that. Didn't get a lot of education. My, I learned that my my father had a, a first grade education, and that was all. So all the other things he learned were, as we call it, street knowledge today, or common sense. Common sense and what you learn from life. So what did you want to be when you grew up then? Because you were a good student. 
and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So what? Well, did, but it, it, initially, what did you want to be? When you were my daughter's age, when you were my son's age, what did you want to be when you grew up? I just wanted to be alive. I wanted to survive. Mm -hmm. At your daughter's age, I, at that particular time, I wasn't thinking about a career because I didn't even know the word career. But you know how she wants to be a doctor. Uh, or one I'm day saying that your, daughter, your daughter's eight years old. At eight years old, I was very mean. When I started school, I was a very angry girl, and I stayed in fights. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember getting in a fight with a 12th grader, and I literally beat her. I got in a fight with a boy. I got a scar on my leg from I rolled on a piece of glass and blood was running down my leg, but I was after him and they were trying to get me from him. But uh, I was just angry, an angry child. I was an angry child. I never picked cotton. I didn't have to. My mama picked cotton and she had a job, a domestic job of cleaning up white folks' homes and doing. But uh, later on, she got a job in an American tent factory sewing. And you said what I wanted to be. Later on, in in high school. Okay, well, let, well in, high the, school, in high school then, what, what were your intentions? Okay, in high, in high school, okay, when I got to maybe the third grade, I started taking education a little serious, and I, I, I knew we didn't, back then, we didn't have really educated teachers. It was anybody in the community that could read and write a little, and, and then in high school, in the upper grade, we had someone that was gone, had gone to college because at that particular time, even when they went to co went to college, they didn't teach black uh, kids how to do anything other than really reading, writing, a little math, and gardening. They had to they had to do personal hygiene how to keep their body clean and their hair clean, and how to do weeding and mm -hmm. hoeing and doing things like that. Maybe that's why a lot of old people grew up with that uh, thing of wanting to. My mama always wanted a garden and things of that nature. But when I got to maybe the uh, sixth grade, it was a change in me, I could see education-wise. I had a beautiful, I had developed a beautiful penmanship, and a lot of teachers had me to write the names of the students in their role book. They had me grading papers and recording grades, and I started just carrying myself as if I wanted to uh, pursue an education and and I had other role models then because I saw ladies that looked different than me. They had uh, things that I wanted and that I how I wanted to dress and how I wanted to be. So I later on I saw a picture of a lady in a magazine with a suit on. It was black with a briefcase and. She, I wanted to be a businesswoman. That's where I got the idea of wanting to be a businesswoman. But I always had an earning or a gift of uh, wanting to get an education. I never thought about sharing it with anyone. And I had a love for law. Back then, my friend, 
my classmates and I used to practice law together in the classroom. The teacher would let us do that. We put on cases and what have you. And believe it or not, he did become a lawyer. Uh, and to this day, I love uh, stories centered around the law. And what have you, but I wanted to be a business person and I kept that dream all the way through college because I majored in business administration and uh, I got a job at uh, keeping books at a public accountant's place and at one of the colleges I were attending Tuskegee I had a job in the English department as a secretary. Now, did, weren't you in the band in high school? Yeah, I started in the band from 8th grade, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. I was in there five years. And what instrument did you play? I played second clarinet. Would you say the arts are important in a school? Cause a lot of schools, are, uh, because of the lack of funds, they're trying to get rid of uh, arts and stuff like that. Would you, oh I, no, children need art. They need to be able to play in the band. They need football. They need, uh, I was in the choir. Uh, they need the choir. They, I love to draw. I did my first picture in the third grade and I gave, I did it for my teacher. Uh, I mean, that was something that I just picked up. I just, I, I, I love to look at something if it's beautiful, if it appeals to me, and I, I like to draw it. Kids need that. They need a way out because not everybody is gifted and want to be a teacher. I, I remember uh, one of my students used to love to draw animals horses especially, and he ended up going to school to pursue uh, a degree as being an animal doctor. They called them a uh, veterinarian. Uh -huh. And one that loved to draw a little cartoon. He was very good at drawing. And uh, like a picture that's, that's doing this right now, and you can flip it and you have the characters to move, like he would draw the different hand movement so if you and he was very good at that and that was something that he could go to school in. I thought drama and that was another thing that they need in 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 uh in the schools because that gives the child an outlet too. I had some that fell in love with acting and when they got in the acting uh that was a way to express some of the things and then they were happier in their other classes and their grades began to improve. I even had a student that was so in love with music. All he wanted to do was play a, a saxophone. He wouldn't do anything else but when he left me and finally went where he could play music, all of his other grades went up and he played to this day, that is his career. You can see he's been on TV and he's very famous playing uh, saxophone. He's a primer. Okay. Now you alluded to uh, the fact that you went to Tuskegee, a legendary school that was founded by uh, Booker T. Washington. What made you go to Tuskegee? I fell in love with it because of Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. I was inspired by those two men that I, I learned something about a black man, about black men that did something that was very outstanding. And I found out that he went to Tuskegee and I found that that was a legendary school that, that started way back and kids that, uh, that went to that school came out very productive in life and I just fell in love with the school and when we went there on a field trip I felt 
even more so in love with it because I had an opportunity to visit uh, uh, George Washington Carver's laboratory and everything in it was just as he left it and I had to touch everything that was in there and Booker T. Washington's statue that was there I had in his grave is right uh, on campus too. I had a picture taken with my hand on his grave and then I climbed up on the statue and he had the statue with him standing there and a slave and he's unveiling the slave and it's called unveiling him to knowledge. And I took a picture with that with him unveiling this slave to the field of knowledge. And I just love the history. So how'd you end up at Jackson State then, Mom? Okay, now that's a long way. They're skipping a long way. Okay. Well, okay, we'll feel, uh, feel me in No, I'm gonna, uh, at the meeting, before I even came to Jasper, and that's the name of, ironically, Jasper County, Jasper, Alabama. Okay, I understand my grandmama and my granddaddy came there. She followed her brothers, the Chapmans, up there. So, but when they came, you know, I had given, I sent a picture or something over there of me. Uh, Willie Pearl. Uh, had a picture of me. I don't know how he got it. I don't. Anyway, uh, he showed it to a guy named Marvin Wells, and Willie Pearl told me that he said, after seeing that picture, he told him, "This is going to be my wife." <laughs> now I had never met him. You know. Um, but when I did go over there to meet them, um, Willie Pearl and Marvin Wells, uh, all dressed up in his army, I mean, he was in the Marines, his Marine outfit came over to my grandmother and granddaddy's house. Then uh, that's the first time I met him. Okay, and after, so basically, all this went down before, before I, Jackson State and yes, all that kind of stuff. This, okay, all of this is a whole nother. Well, I was getting ready to ask you all that anyway, so you, you can just keep going. I was getting ready to ask you how how y'all met and how was it being a military wife and all that kind of stuff. So you can just get into that. Well, uh, I'm going to say I didn't start at Jackson State until a lot of things that happened before. I had got I got married, uh, came home, had Tracy, had Tracy before I came home. Got pregnant with Curly, started back at pursuing my education. Mm -hmm. Had gotten a job and all of that, and then that summer I started at Jackson State. Mm, okay, okay, all right then. Well. Let's go back then. So, you said you and Marvin met through this guy Willie Pearl having your picture. Yeah. And you don't. Have, and he not. He's not a member of our family. Yes, he is. Okay. Willie Pearl Chapman is my cousin. So you sent the picture to the Chapmans. I. Or did you send I, the picture I, to I, the Gibsons? Maybe I sent it to the Gibsons. And somehow and he, he just got hold to the cause, picture. But see, they had been over there and they the one that found me, uh -huh. remember? Uh -huh. They found me in Mississippi. His Willie Pearl brother, two of his, uh, Bay Bay and, I don't, and Larry. Mm -hmm. They came over to Mississippi, to Canton, Mississippi and found me. So, Maybe I gave a picture to them. I don't no, know. Well, you know but I, I don't I, even remember them coming. See, I'm asking about this, Mocha. This is weird. Because in today's society, a whole lot of relationships start from a picture. Through through the phones and stuff. You post a picture. You like the picture on there. 
if it's a girl, you the girls are like a boy's pictures. They think he look cute or whatever. And the boy contact him. Or a dude will like the picture. And then he contact him through the, well, through the that phone. that wasn't the case. I yeah, I know that that didn't exist back then. Uh -uh. But I'm saying it's still like that's the, like the old school Instagram. Instagram is the thing, the site where you don't do them and post pictures today. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so it's like a, <laughs> like an old school version of of uh, Instagram little story. Okay, that that's crazy. Um, now you said he was in the military. He was in the Marines. Marines. All right. Now when you saw you saw him in the Marine get up, did he approach you and tell you? Uh, no, uh, he just we they came over and Willie and I had to be introduced to Willie Pearl too, because mm -hmm. I never met him. My cousin. Uh, Neva, my aunt, my daddy's baby sister, uh, introduced me to Willie Pearl, her cousin, and Marvin Wells. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I was not impressed by the uniform or Marvin Wells. <laughs> Why were you impressed? You mean just the looks or his, his personality? No, I, you first of all, he looked to, he he looked like a white man, pure D white, mm -hmm. blue eyes, red, curly hair, the whole thing. If you didn't know that he was black, you wouldn't have known he was black by looking at him. Mm -hmm. Now Willie Pearl is by Choco, but um, then Willie Pearl's mama was half white. Mm -hmm. That married my uncle Chapman, so that's why Willie Pearl was your cup. But uh, Nora, her aunt Nora. Mm -hmm. But uh, and when he walked off, he was switching. That turned me off. <laughs> what you mean he was switching? <laughs> Maybe he was just trying to strut more. He probably was just trying to show out for you or something. I just stood on the porch and look at him walk away. All the way around the curb. You look kind of funny with the switching. <laughs> that was, that was. So how did he end up winning over then? If he didn't impress you at first, then how did he end up? He, he said he was going to marry you and he ended up married. So how did he pull that off? Oh, they, while I was over there, they had a, a dance at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a blue dress. That so you went to school over there for a little while? No, I went to the dance. Okay. I went. So with some Uncle of the Uncle Charlie was in in high school. Oh, okay. Neva had finished school, but uh, I went to the dance with Charlie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very little. I was so little. I was afraid. I mean, I was ashamed of myself. I would n never had a lot of confidence in thinking that I was pretty. Everybody else thought I was pretty, so they say. But uh, uh, anyway, um, I went to the dance, and in the process of dancing, it was it was somebody. Um, I twist my ankle. <laughs> How did she twist you? I don't know. I had on a little heel trying to dance and, and I twist my ankle and uh, uh, I had to hop over to the chair and he came over operating on my ankle. <laughs> that, was, that was it. He was trying to fix on my foot. <laughs> <laughs> he just started talking. So if you had never twisted your ankle, it's quite possible that no marriage and the no, three kids that no, was over there. No nothing. <laughs> we talked and then he came over the next day and I think we exchanged uh, uh, addresses. Mm -hmm. He got my address and he started writing me. And uh, when he left, he would, he went to Vietnam. And so, going to serious country, it sounded like it was lonely. I wrote, I started writing back to him. And for the 
the length of time, the year or two or whatever, I wrote it. Sent him cookies, sent him another picture, and he had a big picture. Had, so he was a sergeant and one of his guys could draw and he drew a picture of me on a sheet of paper this big and that wide. Beautiful picture. I had to fold up and fold up. I, I should have put it in a frame because it was just like me. It was beautiful. Hmm. Now you were still at high school while he was serving? Yeah. So were you still dating this guy named Moses Cole at the time? Yeah, I was with Moses for a little while, but see, Moses had two other girlfriends too. Hmm. And he ended up. That's another story. Oh. Yeah, I know he went to Vietnam and. The first night over there, he was killed. Hmm. So how was Marvin when he came back from Vietnam then? Very disturbed. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I was at Tuskegee then. The My uncle then and went to pick him up at the airport or something. And uh, I rolled over there with him and uh, they stopped at a light. A uh, little kid was shooting firecrackers and they stopped at the light. He hopped out of the car, went and grabbed the little boy and was shaking him to death. And they had to grab him. I guess it was like a... It's called PTSD. Oh, I don't know what it was called. All it, hey, he was just shaking the boy. They called it shell shock back then. Oh, yeah. Shell shock. And I heard of that. But, uh... Then he used to have nightmares, and then to this day, he could not watch an army picture. So how was, when y'all eventually got married and everything, how was it being a military wife? You know, you had to go, what, live on a base or something in North Carolina and stuff like that? Uh, the first, he told me I could stay at, at Tuskegee, and while he finished up his uh, term, um, in the service. Now, and hold I on, went before, on and married him. Did he volunteer for the service or was he drafted? I don't know. Okay. okay. And all I know is all four, uh, four of the boys, four out of five boys went to service and each one served in a different branch of the service. Mm. Air Force, Navy, Marine, and uh, what's the other one? One, all of them went to service except Melvin. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the plan was for you to finish at Tuskegee. That was the plan. Mm -hmm. So what happened? He reneged. Alright, so, y'all are married. He served out his time in the military. You got my sisters, Curly, uh, Trace and Curly. And you said you had a job. Now, was your first job doing the accounting thing? Or did you do that while you were in college? Uh, I did that when I was in college. But when we came home, um, I knew some people. And uh, they knew me because I grew up here. Um, and... It hap It just so happened that it was a. Uh, we had a white principal at the school, and there was a lady that she just left the job. I think she was sick, and she went on leave mm -hmm. because she was sick, and uh, they needed someone to to sub or uh, for her until she came back. But, uh, and I, I got the job. I was invited to come and do the job. And uh, I did it. I, I went over. Um, and 
it was not in high school, so it was either six, seven, or eight, grade six, seven, or eight, one of them. Anyway, the lady never did come back. <laughs> she never did come back, so I ended up with that job the rest of the year. Uh, why, and then, why did she come back? I don't know. I, I don't know, and I don't think they knew. But she, <laughs> she just never did come back. And so, uh, uh, Mr. McRaney, that was his name, this man, he was from the coast. Um, anyway, he was so impressed with my job that he invited me to come back the next year. And I didn't have a degree in uh, teaching. In fact, I didn't have a degree in anything yet. Uh, but uh, instead of going to a classroom, they had me to work with something. What is it called? Upward Bound or something. Anyway, it was working in the office uh, with Mrs. Dixon. And they had a program for kids that, it was a special program funded by the government or something. And so I ended up being the typist in there and getting the tests ready for them and things of that nature. Anyway, I had a job. It was a job. Now, the year after that, I was invited to come back and work with uh, Mrs. Scott with uh, uh, special education kids. Now, is this the Mrs. Scott that went on to be the first black mayor of, yes. of Canton? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I was her assistant in the classroom. Uh, these kids would come to us at least once a day and then they would go to their regular classes. So uh, I, in that, while I worked with her, I was pregnant with Curly. Uh -huh. And I, that was my experience of working with uh, kids that were slow but they needed help something I don't know what they, they they have a different name for it today but um, I worked with her that year and all of that that was an experience I remember um, this there was one boy in there that everybody he never would go to anybody's class except ours. He would, that was the only class he would come to, and just we had to be tough and we had to, you know, make them mind and everything. Now I had two experiences in that classroom that I'll never forget. Uh, one is. I was afraid of the boy, but I had to be tough and pretend I, did. I wasn't scared of him. So <laughs> I saw the first book walking down the hall. So I got really tough, and he just fell in love with me for some reason. But I mean, and but the child is dead today. He he was in a car accident, and that year we had two kids be in an accident, but the other one lived, and he fell in love with me too. He found out where I lived and to, I don't know where he is now, but he got scratched up and cut up real bad. But he just fell in love with Miss Wells. Miss Wells, you were the best teacher I ever had. And I was not the teacher per se, I was the aide, teacher's aide. But uh, that experience and then I was pregnant with Curly. One day, they, they knew I had a fear of snakes. They put a, a rubber snake in my drawer. And I sat down at my desk and opened the dress, and I saw that snake, and I flipped over backwards in the chair. My legs went up, and I hit the floor. And I'll never forget it. 
I just could tell her, oh, and Miss Scott was just, she's first of all, she said, you all right? And then she just bust out laughing. Everybody was laughing except me. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Can you imagine my legs going straight up? Yeah, I mean, well, every teacher got one of those. I, I, I had embarrassing stuff happen to so, you know what I mean? But that was just cruel. <laughs> that <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> From there, that's where, that's how I end up at Holy Child. Mrs. Scott heard uh, there was a lady over there that was getting ready to go on maternity leave. And, uh, Miss Scott knew about it and she recommended me and I went over for an interview and I was invited to come over and teach. It was fourth grade. So I still, at that particular time, I was going to school. I was going to school. In and, fact, Ho and Holy Child was founded by nuns. Yes, it was the only one black teacher over there. That was Mrs. Gilbert. They were called lay teachers, so she was the only lay teacher over there. All the rest of them were nuns, and they wore full habits. And this school was founded because these sisters... There was a need for education in Canton. In this they segregated felt that community. Yeah. The black children were not getting a good education, and that is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot of things down there teaching school. I learned more than the kids were learning probably, but they didn't know it. Was Sister Thea there when you first got there? No, she was in uh, uh, La Crosse, Michigan, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. She was teaching up there. So when you when she finally came back then, because I know you, you've always told me that's like well, your... I just said I got the job, but let me tell you how I kept the job. Okay, okay, okay. So, see, there too, I was invited to come back, so they didn't ask the lady to come back. In other words, they were impressed with what I was doing. At Holy Child. At Holy Child. Mm -hmm. So... I was invited to stay. Mm -hmm. Every year I was invited to stay. And then they moved me up from fourth grade to sixth grade. And then sixth grade and one year we had to teach, I had to teach sixth and seventh graders in the same, same classroom. I would teach sixth grade over here for a while and give them something to do over here for a while. I was doing, and when I went to teach the seventh graders, the sixth graders were involved uh, academically. Eventually, just lost ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade. Went to eighth grade. Then I was invited to teach ninth, eighth grade. I stayed there 27 years. So uh, about when then did, did you meet Sister Thea while you were teaching it? Sister Thea came in and out and she came later on to stay because her parents got sick. So she came and got a job in Jackson at the diocese. And she stayed there to take care of her mother and father. And then one of them passed, and she had the other one to take care of, and then the other one went on, and uh, that was it. She went back to, to La Crosse, but uh, then she invited us to come up there, and I that's where I took a class at uh, uh, Viterbo. You took a class there? Yes. I mean, you took your students there, or you no, enrolled I, in the class? No, I took the class. We it was about five or six of us. How long were you there? Are you long enough to take a class? In the summer, you have summer classes. So where were the children? We were tracing. Children. No, they were at home with my mama. For the whole they, summer? 
No, this didn't last a whole summer. You know how you all have workshops and you get credit Oh, you went up there for a workshop. Stuff. Okay. But yeah. it was considered as a class yeah, and I got I, credit I, for it. I know what you might see you using. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Alright. Uh, you know now, a lot of folks are pushing for Sister Thea to be a saint. Oh, she's already been uh, canonized. No, she hasn't. Yes, she has. No, she has not, Mama. Well, they told me she had. They were signing a petition because there are six schools named in her honor, and one of them was in uh, Parrish, Texas, where I took you. Mm -hmm. One was there. Um, but uh, n a numerous. She got schools. one. I taught at one in Jackson. Oh yeah. A, a lot of schools are named in her honor, and people had to sign a petition. They had to they had to scrutinize her whole life from uh, her conception all the way up. Well, that's what they I'm saying. They had to find out if she had in, any dealings with a man, or in in school, or boyfriends, and all of that. They well, I'm saying from a personal standpoint, so. I'm looking at her right now on your wall, mm -hmm. and you gave us a painting that was given to you, and she so she overlooks us and and my room at my house. So and, uh, I know this woman is meaningful to you. She, what were her uh, qualities? Tracy as her godchild. Okay, so what qualities did she have that makes people revere her like this? Then, uh, first of all, she she loved God she showed that in her actions and her, the way she lived her life and she was an educator that taught people how to uh, how to praise God she taught the minis Catholic ministers how to preach to congregations and make them feel the spirit and loosen up as she says loosen up in the church and make them feel and come alive instead of doing the old same old mass you know how dull a mass can become you know and I can take I can write one right now <laughs> so she basically brought some soul to the Catholic Church. Yes, and that's what she was teaching. It was a title for it, and uh, she was she was teaching school up in Wisconsin. Though she was mm -hmm. actually teaching rich white folks' children mm -hmm. in a college, Berturbo College. Uh, and when she was in Jackson. She was teaching ministers, the priests. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you stayed at Holy Child for 27 years, but you also taught at Canton High School, and all together, we combined that with your early years uh, that you talked about previously, all together you did over 40 years. What yeah. in the world made the, the average years for a teacher is like three to five years, and then they burn out. That's why we have a teacher shortage in the country right now. So what in the world compelled you to stay in that field? Or what allowed you? What about you and perseverance? What about you allowed you to go for over 40 years when so many teachers don't last three to five years? Okay. Now I told you I wanted to be a business person. Mm -hmm. Got a degree in business administration. Mm -hmm. I tried business after I retired to try it and uh, it didn't work out because I was sick and I couldn't, I didn't have the energy. But once I got involved in education. Now you now you all did so, cause we need, I know you got the, the, the bachelor's in business administration, but you did go on to get I, your... I'm going to explain okay. that. Okay, all right. right. All right. Uh, once I got involved in education, and uh, the sisters had me to take that workshop with the professional lady they had. But anyway, it was in education. And... 
working there at Holy Child and I already had a minor in English. Mass I, I majored in business administration with a minor in English. So all I had to do is finish so many hours to get my master's in a field. So I just, uh, they encouraged me to go to school. They paid for me to go to Wisconsin up there. And uh, Miss Scott paid for me to go to summer school one summer. Each, each summer I went to school until I, I finished well, I finished and got my master's. Then I started working on my, I mean, I started work, I finished and got my, my first degree. Then I started working on my master's in English education. I started taking educational courses since I was teaching. And so I was working on trying to get certified as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's when I had to take the national teacher's exam, uh, the, the written part, and I passed that. Anyway, I went on and uh, got my degree in uh, English education. But while I was at um, Holy Child, I discovered I had another passion, and that was writing producing, and putting on plays. So is that why you didn't quit? Because you wanted to do the plays? No, it's not why I didn't quit. It was just something else that I found that I had a, a, a talent for. And I never had a, I, I, I never had an acting class or any kind of training for it. But it was just something that developed in me that worked out. And even Sister Thea and I, uh, she wrote two two plays for me to put on. And Harry Watson, who was the music teacher, uh, we just started putting on plays. Uh, I guess she saw this talent in me too, and, and she so every year. I was over the Christmas program. I either wrote it or um, I got to play and then just wrote the program and and brought the other classes together and put on a Christmas play. And then one year um, after changing principals, um, we got one principal by the name of Sister Kathleen. And she saw that she saw my talent, and she wanted me to write a, a play for. Her. So she gave me this book to read about Fannie Lou Hamer, and uh, I read the book. And she wanted me to write a play and put it on, and I did. I wrote the play. I produced the play. The characters, the kids were just beautiful. Uh, and the sisters aided me and by I had them to work with the kids on reading, enunciating, and getting the, all the words right before we actually started putting the production together. So I did a lot of overtime work at that school and even at the other school, but I never got paid for it other than through Jesus Christ. I did other extra work and uh, that became one of my passions other than drawing. And I kept the bulletin boards done because I love to draw especially biblical pictures. So <clears throat> So would you say stuff like that? And let me add that. Once I did that play, Sister Kathleen literally cried. I mean, tears, real tears. Mm -hmm. Just She just cried. 
it was so for real. It was so real. The kids actually, the, the little girl, her mother was the principal at Nichols at that time. Uh, but she act, she had that part down. I mean, all of them. And all of, I can say, all of my productions were good except one. And, but it was just a minor thing. But I can say the kids actually made me love what I was doing. So what was your favorite one that you put on there? Cause I like it's, it's almost Christmas time. I remember y'all doing the Christmas play and having them boys sing the Temptations, John. Oh, but at, I, at the end of every Christmas play, if when I got to the high school, the kids I had. Well, y'all did. Y'all did that at Holy Child too. I remember uh, Tyrone and Jerome Holly. Oh doing, yeah, doing that, uh, that's my favorite Temptation song. Temptation Silent Night. That's my favorite song during this time of the year, and I've got to pull it up. I've been listening to blues all day, but uh. At the end of all of the Christmas plays, that was the theme song. So were the Christmas plays your favorite to do? Or was it the Michael Jackson thing? Or was it, it the, the Black History Michael thing? Did you Michael Jackson press? Mm -hmm. That was a good one. Oh, Madea. Uh, yeah, Madea play yeah. was good. And Family Lou Hamer. I liked those three. And the one that I wrote about the uh, From Africa to America. Uh, that wasn't the that wasn't the name of it, but I wrote that one where it actually started in Africa, uh, from Africa to America, and I drew a picture of Africa, and they they had a name, the passage, I the I, middle passage, the middle passage. Mm -hmm. I had the chain coming through there, and then over here I had America, and I liked that one too. I think I remember that one a little bit. That was real little when you did that one. Uh, well, but just to get back to something that, because this is important, because there's a lot of folks that, I left the profession to teach. Uh, I left the profession of teaching for business, but I still uh, believe in the profession. I believe that it's the most honorable profession. Uh, it's the job that spur that that grows all other jobs, and so I got a lot of youngins that go into the profession. So I want to be able to encourage them not to burn out and stuff like that. Cause I'm out here hustling, but uh, I'm not gonna tell everybody to quit teaching. But I want to be an advocate for teachers. And I know if I get rich, then I can make legislators listen to me and help them. But before I can get to that point. I want to know why you didn't quit because some child that's going into this, one of my youngies that just graduated from college or something, they about to go in there and deal with some bad kids. They about to go in there and deal with some principals that they don't like and deal with some colleagues that probably be hating on them. And you dealt with all that kind of stuff. Parents that got out of too. You dealt with all that stuff for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So was it just taking care of us is the reason you didn't quit? Uh, or was it something else that kept you in there all that time? Needing a job was one. One of the reasons I had a family to take care of. And lastly, but you could have well, you could have went and got a job somewhere else, Mom. You were educated, pretty woman, speak well, dress let well. Let me finish the what I'm saying. Okay. See, I had a passion for it then. I had, I loved uh, putting on play. I loved teaching up until the very last year, and it wasn't the kids, it was kids with the attitude, they had an attitude because they saw the principal te treating teachers uh, wrong and treating them un it, not human-like, unhuman-like, and uh, when I saw this, and they wanted to demote me from 11th and 12th grade to 9th grade because they wanted the kids to pick up what they didn't get in junior high. They wanted me to teach them penmanship and they wanted me to teach them 
how well teaching them how to read was a good thing but these were ninth graders and ninth grader going through a tradition a transition that today that was not back in the day. I have to admit we had better students then because we had better parents then. And today it's a different world because of different parents and grandparents. Grandparents are not there for those kids like they used to be where the kids could fall back on grandparents when they didn't have the parents acting up. Now, grandparents want to party with the kids and the parents want to party with the kids and the kids don't have any stable root or anything to just clench on to and to have a good parenting figure in the household. The kids are looking for somebody to help them survive, and they find that in gangs or a group. A gang will say, they, the gang will help me, and they go from, we have them at school for maybe eight hours, but they go back from school back to the street because a lot of kids don't even want to go home. And I've had kids to write about not having a father figure at the house and some that had the father figure at the house, but he wasn't a father. He never talked to them. He would go to work, he'd come home, he'd go to bed, get up, and go to work. You you no interaction and no parenting, no conversation, no love there at scene. The love was probably there, of course, but kids, and I picked this up just reading a paper. You get into a child's mind just by letting them write. You learn so much about what's going on with their life and their families and how they feel, how they feel about the world, I, and that's how I got the information about them. Kids love to learn. Kids are eager to learn and they look for good role models. And I would say to any teacher, if you have it in your heart to love a child and because they are unique, every child is unique, just hang in there if you can and be a good role model. And you just can't be that what they want you to do. You go to school, you learn how to teach, and you, want, you need the freedom to get in the classroom and actually teach instead of somebody coming around with a pen and checking to see if you're up on your feet and if you're looking at Tom, Dick, and Harry's paper to see if they're writing right or if you're talking right and what have you. You need the ability to really get out there and like I could do this in my drama class and that was the end of the day that was kind of a relief I, and teach if you love to teach teach don't let anybody tell you that you can't teach if you want to teach get out and do it be another Joe Clark do it now so it seems like the most satisfying thing or one of the most satisfying things you did uh, during your time as an educator was put on your plays, but what was something else that you found uh, gratifying during your years as a teacher? Uh, working with the children, getting inside their mind, becoming a part of them and letting me become a part of their life and they becoming a part of my life. A lot of children today, I, I see them they miss well. Miss well, some will hug me. They can't now because of what's going on. But oh, you, they tell me you're the best teacher I ever had. And I just said, Lord, every group that leaves me, I don't feel that I've taught them enough. Because I call them a different crop. Every year you get a different crop. You know, some crops are better than others, and some that. But, uh, you never feel that you did enough. And I feel that when they left me, I didn't do enough. Are they ready for society? I want them ready to be able to survive in this man's world. They're ever changing. 
And so the satisfaction of dealing with and loving children. Seeing the satisfaction of the eyes light up when someone really understands what you're trying to get them to understand. How did it make you feel when the young lady uh, honored you with the, the poem in Washington or you were nominated in Washington? That was someone? Angela Jackson that she had to write a paper or give a speech and she told them that I was her best teacher and mm -hmm. that was at Holy Child and that was the uh, sixth grade. And then, didn't some young lady write poems about you and stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, she it? wrote three poems. She always sang a, hummed a song, and I did. And Holy Child, I was always humming. I was happy. And a lot of people in Canton called me crazy, especially with my degree, the master's degree. I could get more money. I could get this and that and the other. And, and I was working there, really, <laughs> I didn't realize it until I left how much we were I broke. didn't look. We, we were broke when you, I saw one of your pay stuff, that's when yeah. I finally. I really um, didn't look forward to the paycheck. I didn't even know when it was time for it. When she probably checked it around, I was surprised because I, I fell in love with the kids and what I was doing. Well, you scared me away. That's why I didn't want to be a teacher. Cause you, I would see you in that stack of papers, and grading those papers all night. And, and it wasn't a, a laptop like this. Like when I was teaching, I put my grades in. But now, one year I had to do like you did. But when I, once I started teaching high school, I just put all the grades in electronically. But putting all those grades in by hand and oh, stuff. Oh, it had gotten uh, easy then. No, I'm talking, I, I remember you with the grade book. I remember I, the book. I'm saying if that somebody, was easy If somebody then. didn't uh, do the assignment, you'll put a zero and put an X in it. Uh -huh. You put the X in so if the parent tripped about it, you can show it. Hey, that X means your child didn't even attempt to do the work. I remember all that. And I'm like, my mom was at work. I was at school. My mom was at work. And then I get home, my mama's still in there working. You still in there, you won't watch your soap operas, but while you watching your soap opera, you in there grading papers. So it's like your job, you did not have an eight hour job. No, you had like a 12 to 16 hour job. But it was a satisfaction to see that someone got a good grade. It really was. And it was, I don't know, I just, I love Holy Child because of the praying. I like going to church with them. I like putting on programs in the church. And then when they gave me the eighth grade, I like doing the graduation, inviting speakers to come to inspire the kids. And uh, I love to do ballet. I love that that picture up there represents one of my passions that I love to do and even at Tuskegee in the halls I remember putting on a little program for the kids on the first floor. Ballet, I love to listen to the music and interpret the music with your mind and body and soul. So what was the most difficult thing about teaching then? Uh, lesson plan. I think most teachers would probably say that's a top five. That's that, uh, that really <laughs> lesson plan. It's now it would be all right if you know uh, the individual not gonna really look at it or whatever. But you find some little nutty person that's gonna actually <laughs> look to the, you. Really have to be on your p's and q's, but. Uh, I like the way Sister Kathleen uh, divided the book up. You like if you have a book and it's got 1,000 and some pages in it and she divided by four and you're supposed to be from right here to here uh, at the first quarter. In the second quarter, you have so many pages you're supposed to have covered. That's a pacing guide. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Okay, was it 
Was anything else tough other than the lesson plans? Oh, okay. I said uh, dealing with some disagreeable parents. Listen, I never forget one night we uh, it was on parents uh, teachers conference when we kids had the parents had to come pick up the report cards, and I had a uh, father to come in and threaten me, and I thought he was going to hit me, but. Uh, it was because his child was called cheating and he got an F on it. I don't know if he had been drinking or not, but uh, I didn't change the grade. I stood my ground because he was literally called cheating. And I called him. Hmm. You did so, that for 40 years. Couldn't, couldn't have been me. Oh, well, so came in there I had like to be yeah. professional. I, father Luke, the father that was down there when I left, gave me some good advice. And, you know, he said, stay in your ground, but be polite, always be professional. Uh, say something nice about the child at the beginning before you start laying in all the bad stuff. But he came in on me like that. He came in ready to fight. And I just kept my cool and stayed in my seat. Yeah, he would have got his fight messing with me that day then. Now what some parents, some men came in making passes. I mean, really making passes. Won't want to know my number and I'm here trying to talk about your child. And you still talking about I would sure like to take you, or take you out to dinner, blah, blah. Now, that in my worst year of teaching was my last one because the, the, they were just mean to me. I was old and uh, my last year at Holy Child. I don't even know if I should ask you this because I have no idea what's going to come out your mouth. Well, I already know what it is. Go on and ask. What's a funny story about me that you would like to share with my fans? I came home one day and I'm, I'm going to see, I'm getting ready, was I getting ready to use the tape or were you in there looking funny or something? Anyway, this tape had a popsicle stick in it. So the VCR. The VCR. <laughs> the VCR. And I had tried to get it out and it was messed up. And I asked you, did you do this? And, uh, and I'm trying to make you tell me, did you do And you're saying, no, it was a little boy that looked just like me. That did that. <laughs> That's what he said. And I knew somebody looked just like me did that. There is somebody that looked just like me. I saw him in college. I walked into the McDonald's. Joe and uh, Ray and them, they'll tell you. Walked into the McDonald's. This guy was working behind the counter. And I stopped. <laughs> because I thought they had a mirror up in McDonald's. And he stopped and looked at me. And we both like Light skin, slim, big eyed, long neck, everything to a T. So Marvin probably had a baby down there too. <laughs> Marvin was hoarse, but he didn't. He wasn't this everywhere. guy looked just like me, spitting image of me, like I we I was terrible. Yep. <laughs> sure well, you know. and another one, you told me. Before you were born, that every once in a while, I went to my eating something, it hit you right on the head and you could feel it. <laughs> <laughs> While in my stomach, you could feel me eating some stuff and it would hit you on the head. Didn't somebody try to buy me? Oh, yes. Let's we'll see who was in the hospital. We went to the hospital and we were sitting on the outside there. And it's uh, 
limousine pulled up to pick up these white people. This white lady and this white man looked very rich. And uh, they stopped. And just was amazed by you. They just loved you. And they asked me if I would sell you to them. And they promised to give you the best of everything. You would have, you wouldn't have to worry about anything. You will have the best life ever. If I would just sell you to them. Well, I'm glad you didn't. No people probably would have made me their personal slave or something. Adam, you were a toddler. I know. They, they, Mom, I was an infant. Sound like I was an infant, a newborn. No, you weren't an infant. You were. A so what were we were doing at the hospital. We were there again for another some, reason. Yes, we were sitting on the outside. Maybe Mama was in there visiting. Maybe Mr. Willie was in there. I don't know. I, it was the vet, DA, so. Had to be Mr. Willie was in there, I guess. Oh, well, you made the right decision. These people, people do stuff like that. They slavery still go on there, or they would have sold me to somebody. Or they wanted to buy you, Adam. They would have might have bought me and sold me. Why are they gonna buy you and sell you? Sell my body parts. Now that kind of stuff happens today. These kids going miss before this pandemic hit. The one of the biggest stories in the country was child abductions. Okay. And they they to selling sell they, parts. They selling body parts. They are uh, selling uh, kids into. Uh, Adam, you were high yellow, and I had you dressed real pretty. They really set out your color. You were, you're darker than you were then. You were high yellow. They and don't your mean hair they looked me like right. it was curly, really good, and I had you looking pretty. So you thought they were serious and were going to treat me right and give me a oh, rich yes. life? Oh, yes. And I wanted that a long time. I said, did I do right? He would have had a better life, maybe. No, Mom. I keep telling you to quit saying that. You made the right decision. Okay? We finna get uh, this money. Yeah. I ain't worried about that. Okay? I, because through struggle now, I can relate to everybody. See what I'm saying? I can relate. If I went to them people and just, even if, let's say, best case scenario, they're going to treat me right. I, that would have been weird. First of all, I was a black boy. I would eventually I was gonna figure out I was a black man, and then I would have been <laughs> messed up in the head like President Obama was messed up in the head. Oh yes. Or, or, or and then I wouldn't have been able to relate to the people of the struggle and stuff like that. So it's good. Okay. That's good. You did a great job with me. You stop that. All right. Last question. Now my most popular song to date is honoring you. Now, you know it's called Mama Sick, but most of the song ain't about you being sick. The hook is says Mama Sick, but most of the song is about- no, Mama is sick. I know, Mama, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you all that medicine I'm taking. I know, but most of the song is a tribute in telling your story, really, and thanking you for taking good care of me. That's what I'm saying. Okay. You right for not selling me to no rich people, <laughs> because, I just said in the beginning of the song, wasn't for you, I would have sold dough. I'm very attracted to that lifestyle. You know that. I love the Godfather, I love uh, Peyton Pool, well, I love I'm all that very, gangster stuff. I'm very, I'm amazed. I am really amazed and I asked God, how did I do it? And I couldn't have done it without him. But what I'm saying is my most popular song is about you. Okay? Okay. Uh, and from the reaction to that song, the comments and all that kind of stuff, people let me know that they are they, they are hurting. Like a lot of well, people, yeah. either their mama passed on already, people saying their mama passed in their arms, uh, uh, or, so or, sad today. or they, or they a had A lot of people can't even hold their mama or even kiss them or anything. They can't even be with them because of this pandemic. Yeah. And every night I see, they they give a tribute to the ones that are gone on, and most of them are my age and older. And he, right here in Canton, uh, Curly's friend, her grandmother just passed, and the irony is her son passed 
this week, this the same week. Her son, he was a hero. He he rushed into the house and got a lady out. The house blew up and he went in there and got her. He's a James. And uh, he passed away from this COVID-19. And his, his mama just passed yesterday. He passed about four days before her. And both of them did now. And I knew him, and both of them go to church. We're going to church back here. She was 103. All right, so with that in mind, then, and, and knowing that there's a lot of people that can't be with their loved ones, this this holiday season, and like I said, a lot of my fans absolutely love that song that I made about you. What's something that you would say to them? Because uh, I say every one of the comments, I always respond to them and give them encouragement, stuff like that. Uh, but what's something that you would say to them at this this uh, holiday season? And I know you love the holiday. When I was growing up, you always loved Christmas. I and love we would decorate. Decor decorate and uh, songs all throughout the house. Especially Temptation like Silent what Night. You feel Temptation like Silent Night on repeat. <laughs> and uh, drink eggnog and all that kind of stuff and make me watch a Christmas carol. But. It's a lot of my... my and that's one of the plays I love to put on, too. The Christmas Carol. It's a lot of my fans that can't do that right now with, with their mama. So, uh, mm -hmm. do you have an encouraging word for, for the, those that's dealing with that? And for those who have to be like a caregiver. There's a lot of them that have to be a caregiver like I am to you right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, do you have a, anything inspiring you can say to them? First, I'd like to thank them for watching the uh, video and uh, I appreciate their comments about the the song. I love the song too and I thank you for doing it for me and I'm so happy to be here to hear it and appreciate it. And I would say to anyone that has a mother, mother that's still living, just love her because you only get one regardless of what kind of mother she is. I mean, you can help bring her out. If she's one that is not a true mother, you can make her be a true mother by showing her a lot of love and affection. And that helps. And it's hard bringing up children on your own, being a single mother after being divorced, but I was fortunate enough to have uh, someone that was my backbone and that was my mom. So if you don't have, if, if your mother is still living, love her. Show her that love. And if she's already gone, Remember the love that she gave you. It is still with you. It's in your heart. When your mother leaves you from this earthly body, she is not leaving you totally. She is always a part of you. She's in your heart. She's in your mind. And she's looking out for you. If she, God is let her be that angel that would always look over her children and love the children. And because they know they can't stay here forever. Everybody has to go. But when they go, they're not gone. As long as you love them. Alright, we're going to end it like that. I think that's well said. I appreciate you, Mama. See, it wasn't that bad, was it? No, it wasn't. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give you a little smooch. Sure. Give you a little smooch. Mm. <laughs> so that was my interview with my mama, Mary Wells. And uh, I hope y'all gained something from uh, that interview. I hope that her story 
uh, gave you some kind of inspiration to keep fighting through uh, whatever you go through. Uh, you, you heard her talk about uh, her pain and, and, and uh, just the fact that her father was murdered uh, in such a heinous way and uh, growing up not knowing who her true father was and uh, finding that out uh, later in life and uh, not she didn't uh, have any siblings it's just her and my grandma you know what I'm saying but she was still able to fight through that and uh, my grandma wasn't educated but uh, because she had to drop out of school to be a sharecropper uh, you know dealing with uh, this uh, racist system dealing with Jim Crow at the time uh, but my mama rose up to have a master's degree and uh, you know she started working on a specialist uh, you know and raised three kids by herself so and educated other folks kids for over 40 years so if she was able to make it you can do it and uh, for all you uh, educators out there or future educators I hope you look at her and gain some inspiration too and just heed her words heed her words I did it for a decade okay I did it for a decade before I got out here uh, to be an entrepreneur but she did it for over 40 years and to be quite honest with you, she wants to go back. I won't let her. She wants to at least sub or do something. I said, Mama, mm -mm. You, your time, if, if, if you put in your work for trying to change the world, it's my time now. Uh, I strongly encourage all you real ones out there to uh, sit down and talk with the ones that you love, you know, especially the elders. Because when those stories are gone, they're gone. Hopefully you saw that I learned some things about my mother just in that interview that I never knew. Uh, and so you got to talk to your people. Talk to your people. And uh, especially all you real ones who uh, are dealing with so much during this holiday season. Because uh, I know many of you gravitated towards me and my music once you heard that uh, the song Mama Sick. I just want to say to y'all that if your m mother uh, has passed on, um, I know that hurts. I haven't lost my mother and I know that hurts. I lost my grandmother. I think about that pain. That still hurts me to this day. I can only think about the pain of losing my mother. So I feel you. You understand? I, I, I really feel you on that. But I say long live your mother. Or if it's your father, long live your father, whoever you lost. Uh, if you're like me and you're being a caregiver to your parent, keep fighting. You feel me? Keep fighting. God bless you for the good work you are doing. Uh, from me, my mother, and everybody at IG Entertainment, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all for watching. Make sure y'all like the video. Make sure you share it with as many people as possible because we need more and more positive stories like this out. Uh, make sure you uh, follow me across all social media platforms. Uh, and make sure you shop with statement tees. Every t-shirt you wear makes a statement. <laughs> uh, but again, I appreciate y'all watching. And remember, everybody got a story. So listen. One.